Welcome back, gang, for the next installment in our epic first episode with Not So Dog. So stoked to have you back as always. Massive shout out to our sponsors who help make the show happen. Huge shout out to Seeds here now, your number one spot to get all the hottest breeders and all the latest drops. A guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. That means if you finish a harvest and you're not stoked with the results, hit them up. They'll make it right. Who else offers such a quality guarantee? Seeds here now. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Huge shout out to our newest sponsors, Organics Alive. No matter what level of expertise you have, they have a range of products that are going to improve your next grow. Truly incredible organic powdered fertilizer. If you're looking for an easy solution while growing in soil, they have it. With veg formulas, bloom formulas, they've got a range of different products at different MPKs to help no matter what situation you're in. I highly recommend it for all the organic growers out there. Massive shout out to Organics Alive. We love your products. Thank you so much for the support. Likewise, huge shout out to Copert Biological Systems, your number one pest and predator company. If you have aphids, get the Afipar M. If you have spider mites, get the Spidex Vital. I promise you guys, they're the best in the industry. The Spidex Vital, it's got proof of predation technology, meaning you see the predators turn orange in front of your eyes. What more proof do you want that they're working hard for your garden? Get some beneficials in there before you're up against a battle. I love releasing them regularly. Shout out Copa Biological Systems. We appreciate you so, so much. Likewise, huge shout out to our buddies at Pulse Sensors. Whether you're running a single tent, a single room or a multi-state operation, Pulse Sensors are here to help you get the best harvest to date. Helping you to monitor all the variables you may not be consciously considering like VPD, PPFD, humidity, temperature, so much more. Check them out. They've just released the Pulse Hub, an integrated unit to help you track all parameters and inputs via one central hub. It's been super popular. You should check it out, guys, before it's sold out. A huge shout out again to Pulse Sensors. If you want to get serious, get a Pulse. And last but not least, a massive thank you to the Patreon gang. You are truly the lifeblood of the show. If you would like to get early access to upcoming episodes, unheard exclusive Patreon episodes featuring the likes of 707 Seedbank, Bodie, Mr. Bob Hemphill, Mean Gene, Trichome Jungle, the list keeps going on and on. We've also been giving away genetics on our Discord. How good does that sound? Shout out Patreon, www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. In this episode, we're here to learn more about NorCal history, not so dogs breedings, Mendo perps, and so much more. Without further delay, let's get into it. There you go. Look, that's interesting because you're giving me a, a nice little segue when you mentioned the lemon tree. Because I was going to say, you know, Caleb at CSI has done some really cool crosses using, you know, the Not So Dog headband. And some of the notable ones that I've seen garner a lot of fanfare from the community the Chem D cross headband and the lemon tree cross headband. And. I can sort of understand why both of them have a lot of popularity. I'll, I'll be honest, I've actually got a pack of both of those and I've stashed them away for myself. My question is, did you expect some of these headband hybrids to get the popular reception that they have? And are there any particular crosses you're hoping to see happen with some of the cuts you're associated with? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so that's like a... I gave, I've given various cuts uh, to CSI. Um, some of which like the headband he's, he's already used and released some of which are still, uh, private or in the works or whatever. And it was mostly just because I'm mostly a private breeder. Uh, and you know, once you start chatting about a bunch of this stuff and you have interest out there and you want to, you, you want to figure out a way to spread it out to the community to some degree. Right. And since he's so prolific and he's also popular and does a good job, he was a good vessel for that. Right. Um, and you know, yeah, there are some things that I think that are unexpected. I didn't grow any of the LA by lemon tree, but I did grow 
um, at a, at a project I did an outdoor a few years ago, I did grow a ton of his work outside and I did grow quite a few, uh, lemon tree and other hybrids, uh, Calio hybrids and stuff like that. And much like train wreck, uh, that terp that we were talking about earlier, the, the citrus is a dominant terp in the sense that it really pops up in a lot of the progeny. It's definitely something that combines and gets passed on really strongly. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of the lemon stuff, uh, would be, uh, you're going to smell a lot of lemon. And my hope if, if you grew some LA by lemon tree is that the LA would lend some, some gassiness and some skunk and some potency to the the lemon tree side of it that would that would be the hope that i would have is that it would give it would give it some legs if you would uh the chem d by la seems to be the most popular one so far uh people have been getting a lot of wild stuff out of that which is cool because uh those two strains are i don't know i'm not really big on rating strains but they would definitely go into like my all-time favorites category uh, so it, it, and I think they cross, it seems like they crossed really well. And I still have people sending me pics all the time of those hybrids and people really happy with what they're finding in there. So, um, that's a positive. Yeah. Nice one. That's some great feedback. And, um, some people might be a bit curious about what do you mean? The LA, maybe not entirely sure on the backstory on that. I'd love to get your version of events. The, you know, the headband cut, the not-so-headband cut, also originally known as the L.A. Kush. How did that come to be? How did you get your hands on it? Did you ever interact directly with uh, Mandelbrot, or was that just sort of coincidental? Oh, no. Um, Mandelbrot and I were friends, right? And there's a buddy of mine who introduced us, uh, my homie uh, Josh, and uh, he... Um, you know, Mandelbrot was more into, let's, I don't know how to put it. Uh, let's put it this way. Mandelbrot was, was deep into the Grateful Dead hippie side of things. Right. And in the early two thousands, he was getting it more interested in switching over and trying to mess around with some weed. Right. And it so happened that my buddy and I, uh, stat, uh, I called Staten Island on the show before, had been doing some projects together and some breeding work over the last number of years uh, together. And so I had a whole big collection of, um, you know, seeds and hybrids and stuff that I had made, right? And he wanted to get started on a seed company and he wanted to start messing around with stuff, but he didn't really have very much stock. So he ended up... Um, he ended up getting a bunch of seed from me, uh, mostly super dog hybrids, super dog, Maui, super dog by super dog, various things, a handful of cuts. Um, I gave him a couple of my super dog selections. I gave him my sour diesel, uh, a couple things like that. And he had gone down to LA and he had gotten this headband that they were calling the LA Kush. Right now you got to realize this was in the very early two thousands. So it was before most people had heard of or the really the Kush wave of L.A. had happened, because obviously, as we're both well aware, what became known as Kush was very different than this cut. Right. Um, this was very much more of a diesel cut, very much more of a, of a sort of a sour looking type of thing. So he brings it back up. And he's like, hey, I want to give you this thing. I have this other sour diesel and I have this headband that I want to give you. And so he drive he drives down from Humboldt and he gives me two headbands and two sours, but they're unlabeled. But he's like, just grow them, save all the moms and grow them side by side. So I grow these things up and I'm showing it to friends and everyone's like, oh, it's all the same weed. There's no difference. Like none of these moms are different. None of the rooms are different. None of the greenhouse is different. It's all the same weed. And they're like, he gave you, he must've given you his version of sour diesel. This looks like sour to me, just different. It's different, but it's definitely sour. So for four or five months, I thought he had messed up and just given me sour diesel. And then he came down to my house one day and he walks into a room that was about 10 days away from being done. And he's like, oh, this is all LA. Uh -huh. I, I must've not given, I must've not given you the sour. This is the LA. This is the headband for sure. 
you know, and actually, and so I asked him for a sour and he's like, you know what? The one you gave me is way nicer than the one that I had. So there's not even any point. Just keep this one. So I got that cut. I don't know. I think he got it in 02 or 03 or something like that, right in that range. A long time ago now. And um, I got it as, you know, he got it as the L.A. Kush, um, but it was called a headband. Right. And that's all I know about it, to be honest. And he ended up uh, starting Emerald Mountain Seed, Emerald Mountain Seed Company um, with a lot of the stuff that I had given him and some of the stuff that he had. And he blended that L.A. He made you probably heard of it. The 707 headband. Mm hmm. That is the that L.A. cut cross to an Afghani he had that he released as a seed line. And that still exists. Um, and he passed it out pretty freely. And I passed it out pretty freely. And somehow I'm not going to say I'm the only person that uh, that has it because that would be presumptuous. But it does seem like it, it's not one of the more reliable sours uh, in the sense that it's a little bit more environmentally sensitive and people didn't hold on to it. So somehow it seems like I ended up being one of the only people that had it. And then when I started chatting about it, it's got a terrible name, dude, in the sense that like it's the least circulated headband. Right. So if you start talking about headband, people want to know, is it the one that Bob Hemp Hill has that Matt Elite has? Is it the one? Is it the Loompa? Is it the this? Is it the that? It's none of those. Right. And then if you call it the L.A. Kush. Obviously, people think of Kush, they think of TK or Ghost or, you know, or Larry or Irene or whatever, right? So its name isn't very descriptive in that regard. And um, it was never called Nazos anything up until I started doing the podcast with Matt. And then for lack of a better way of describing it, people started trying to identify it as like, oh, it's this headband. Well, which one it is? Oh, it's the one Nazo has. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's kind of one of those ways where like my name got organically added to it and, you know, fairly recently really, but, um, it is, I got it as LA Kush headband. Yeah. Okay. Look, that makes a lot of sense. And look, I, I think that from what I've heard, that's actually a similar story with Lumpa's headband, right? Like apparently he never called it Lumpa's headband it was just people he traded it on the forums and people were like oh this is the headband I got from Lumpa I think Lumpa you know Lumpa and I go back and forth and stuff and like he doesn't like me very much but um I think he intentionally added his name to it uh and I also think that then he got what's weird about it is when you start adding names to things for people a lot of times people get protective of their association with things Right. And it, it, there's a weird pride element that comes in. So, I mean, I, uh, you know, and it's, it's also weird for me to talk about Mandelbrot because he's passed. And so I typically like, you know, uh, and his, you know, his brother is, has a seed company now and stuff and Emerald mountain legacy and, um, you know, like his life and how he was, is you know, it's a little dicey to talk about in some regards, but because it's a shame because he passed away early. Yeah. And, and unexpectedly and suddenly. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, they he people want, you know, when I talk about when I tell that story, sometimes people are like, oh, you're trying to take credit from him. You're trying to take this. You're trying to take that. And I don't think people get how cannabis really was back then. You know how you were talking about when it came to the land race stuff, like you're standing on the shoulders of others? Yeah. Right? So Mandel was standing on my shoulders to get his seed company started. But I'm not standing on the ground. I'm starting. I'm standing on the shoulders of Staten Island and various other friends who gave me the strains that I ended up working with that we made those seeds with. Mm. And they're standing on the shoulders of the people. You know what I mean? And it just keeps going back to where it's like, well, who gets credit? You know, it's like, well, when did, how did you hold the baton? So, you know, uh, did I give Mandel most of what he used to start his seed company? Yeah. Does that mean I'm responsible for all the choices that he made and all the effort that he put in and everything he did after that? Of course not. No, I didn't even charge him back then because back then, like just, you know, there was, like I was saying, and 
2001, 2002, 2003, there was no outlets for American private breeders to really sell their seeds. Yeah. Right. There wasn't. So most of us, we, you know, I would, I, I mentioned it before on the show too. Like we, you know, we go to these harvest festivals, you'd be given 50 or a hundred seeds away to friends all the time. Try this. I made this. I got way more than I need. Take some. Right. It was also pre reversals for most people. So they were all regular seeds. And, um, you know, so yeah, I mean, I gave, I gave Mandel probably over a thousand seeds. Right. But I had so, so many, dude. Like, what was I going to do with, like, what, you know, honestly, like, I, I mean, I, I gave away seeds to all kinds of friends because, um, what, what would I do with all of them? Yeah. It gets a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's like, okay, I got, I've got, i got 50,000 seeds of super dog hybrids. And so every homie of mine that wanted them, that wanted to pop them, that wanted to run them in their greenhouse, that wanted to do something with them, sure. Because it was long before you there was really any weird ego in the American scene about like, oh, I'm going to make a seed company. This is my shit. You're going to have to pay me. You're going to have to. It was more like weed nerds trading. Yeah, more organic. Right. It was very much more so organic. And so now it's like people are like you try to honestly talk about it and people are like, oh, you're trying to steal thunder. Right. But it has nothing to do with that, really. It was just a different era. That's really all I can say about it, it was just a different era. It was like my homie wanted to start a seed company. I had way more seeds than I knew what to do with. He had a couple of clones. He wanted some more clones. He wanted some more stuff to start with. Here you go. You know. Here's 1,200 seeds. Here's 1,400 seeds. They're like nine different crosses of different things. See what you find. Go for it. Look, I uh, we're definitely going to jump into that, but I want to quickly ask one other thing, and then we'll we'll loop back to it. Which is, in terms of the the headband with Lumpers versus your one, how would you describe the differences? Because I think they're both two very good ones that go around as the term headband. What do you think are the differences, the similarities? And why do you think there are so many different headbands out there? It feels to me like it's it's got to be up there with Sour in terms of like the number of different cuttings that go around with the same name. Well, um, so there's different stories to it. You know, um, I'll start with the headband name. It seems like headband ended up becoming a popular name, right? And then... It seemed like headband was also tied into the the sour diesel origin story. And there was a lot of mystery around it. Right. And so when there's mystery around it and there's money and there's rep to be made, sometimes names get tagged onto things. OK, so I have no idea why my why the the headband, the L.A. that I have is called headband. It's just that's what it was. That's what it, that's what it was. Right. Lumpas. I think, and he might get real mad at me for this, but I think it's an OGS one. Yeah, I agree. My my cut is very much in the sour or the diesel type of family look. It's, it's stretchy. It's got that. It's got those similar terps to it. It's got similar growth pattern. It's very much in that family, right? Uh, Lumpa is very much an OG Kush type, you know, in in my opinion. Uh, it's really good smoke. Uh, it's very potent. It's enjoyable smoke. Um, but to me, it's just a really nice cush, you know, like if you had that and you had ghost and you had triangle and you had a few different things, it would fit right in that same movie. Yeah. And then you've probably tried, I call it, you know, I mean, people call it different names, but you've probably tried that other one. I call it the 56. Um, you know, uh, um, Matt elite has it. Um, uh, I see collective has it. Bob Hemp Hill has it right. Yeah. Um, it's, I think, I think it's the, the one that skunk VA uses too. Uh, and that one's a cush. And apparently, uh, you know, there was, you know, you've probably heard the story, but there was, there was some drama and there was maybe some violence. or there was some issues going on in Southern California over this cut. And this guy took it to, to San Francisco and they didn't really want any of that drama following them. So they intentionally renamed it Headband. Ah, uh, okay. Right? That's the very simple version. So you have a couple of what I consider to basically be OG Kush types. 
as headband. And don't get me. I, and then there's so much confusion where people are like, oh, this is the day wrecker. This is the original diesel. This is that headband. And they all have these very murky stories. So I don't necessarily know. I'll be able to like explain every single one of them to you. But I would just say that headband was a famous strain that people wanted to tie strains that they had to that lineage and to that legend. And the legend was murky enough. It allowed for a lot of that to happen. Yeah. Okay. That certainly makes sense, actually. So let's go back to our, our first question we normally start with. Take me back to the beginning. What was your very first experience with cannabis? Oh, my God. That is normally how, how you start, but we really went off field on this one. Um, it's not very exciting. Uh, my first experience with cannabis was basically Mexican, right? And in the early 90s, when I started smoking weed, uh, I knew of two kinds of cannabis that you could get. You could get brown seeded cannabis that was compressed, and you could get hopefully lesser compressed green cannabis that was you know, and, you know, the good stuff had less seeds and was less compressed. And the worst stuff had a lot more seeds and a lot more stems and was heavily compressed. Um, and so my in high school, that's kind of really what we had access to. That was what was, you know, it was twenty dollars an eighth for brown weed and it was thirty dollars an eighth for green weed. Uh, and, you know, kind bud, which is what we, you know, um, we all smoke now. Uh, I first experienced that going to a dead show when I was 15. Uh, I'd never, I'd never seen weed that nice before. Um, and it's, I like Mexican weed, right? So the effect that I got, I had plenty of fun getting stoned on brown Mexican. You know, I came up in an era in America where, all the various imports that people talk about, like Colombian and Thai and this and that and everything else, that was all previous to me. It was basically just different grades of Mexican. That's all I saw. Um, and that was true in Florida. Uh, I guess in Florida, we'd see a little bit of, of Jamaican, but the Jamaican was terrible. A lot of times the Jamaican would get sprayed with Raid, uh, which was a cockroach killer. Um, it was adulterated. Um, and, you know, who knows? I was also a teenager. So it's not like, um, I had very good access. I don't come from a family of pot smokers. None of my, like, I didn't, I don't have one of those origin stories that my dad or my uncles or anyone like that got me into it all early. Um, my experience with weed was basically, uh, friend groups, you know? And so what is that? What is your 15 or 16 or 17 year old friend group have access to? That was sort of the start of it. So some people get on here and they're like, oh, you know, my uncle was doing this amazing stuff and he was smuggling and he had all these rare seeds. That was not my start. In fact, I would say that maybe like my curiosity about weed and my drive to learn more is started from the fact that it was so hard to get for us. Right. And figuring out information about it was hard. And you got to realize that like when I started smoking, there was no Internet. So it was like, maybe you get some high times, you know, and read some, read some stories in high times. There was a few books out about it. I, I started growing weed in when I was 18, when I moved out of my parents' house, mostly because I wanted to be able to get good weed. Like I could get on dead tour and I couldn't find it reliably around me at all. Uh, look, you preempted my next question. Cause I was going to say, I find with most younger people, the thing that stimulates them to start growing is getting exposed to some like super phenomenal weed. And you're like, wow, I've got to do this for myself. Would you say that it was on dead tour that happened? And, and if so, do you remember the specific bud that gave you that light bulb moment? I mean, you know, you have to realize too, that like names were fairly uncommon. Like there was a lot of weed on dead tour that was like Humboldt County organic outdoor. That's what it was sold as, you know, kind bud. Yeah. Kind bud nuggets you know i got them nuggets you know because <laughs> instead of being compressed it was like nicely shaped nugs you know flour um so yeah i don't really remember what it was i just remember that it was green and stinky and not compressed and seedless and it worked way better yeah um 
and even to jump forward a second, you know, when I was 22 or something like that, when I first moved to Mendocino County, most weed around here was named where it was from. Instead of getting like a specific strain, you would be like, oh, this is some Panther Gap weed. This is some weed from Whitethorn. This is some Alder Point weed. This is some weed that I got up on Spy Rock Road. It was more like location based than even the name, right? Mm. And most of it was grown from seed and most of it was mixed phenos in pounds or in ounces, right? It was, it wasn't like it was monocropped like it is today with like most people weren't growing cuttings. Uh, most people, uh, maybe indoor, they were growing cuttings, but most outdoor and greenhouse stuff was from seed. And so it would be, you might have five or six different kinds of weed in the bag. Now, maybe they were sisters to each other. So it wasn't like you had like wildly different strains mixed together. Mm. Right. But like somebody would grow a batch of seeds and they would trim it up and they would weigh it up and then they would move it all along. And then there you go. And so my early experience was like, um, you know, kind bud was seedless. Kind bud wasn't compressed. Kind bud tasted really nice. And I didn't know what, uh, I didn't know anything, dude. So I got out of high school and I bought, uh, Mel Frank and Ed Rosenthal's book, um, marijuana horticulture. And I bought, uh, marijuana botany from Rob Clark. And I bought, uh, what was the third one? Uh, Jorge Cervantes's book that he still puts out. Um, the, uh, indoor marijuana hold record culture. And other than that, and a, and a little bit of advice from some older hippies that I saw occasionally at, at shows or whatever, that was kind of how I started. Um, uh, I had one light on a mover, a four by eight tray. Um, I had a, a buddy of mine, uh, he's passed away now. I can say his name, Johnny winners. Um, and he was probably about eight or nine years older than me. And he was way into the grateful dead um, widespread panic, uh, various, uh, things of that nature. He was definitely a, a tour rat and he, uh, had a house in Carbondale, Illinois, and he gave me these cuttings called the crystal chunk. And that was the very first, um, you know, I grew 1000 watt light on a six foot mover over a four by eight tray of crystal chunk when I was probably the summer of 1994. Um, and that was the first, that was the first time I ever, actually the first time I ever grew weed, to be honest, uh, is I used to sit in my parents' house and de-seed, you know, I had to de-seed and de-stem the Mexican weed that I was buying. Right. So I would de-seed it and then I would flick the seeds and stems out my window into the bushes. Okay. And that was that. And it was my job to mow the family lawn. So one time in spring, I'm out there in Chicago and I'm mowing the lawn and I come upon these bushes and there's like three foot tall pot plants. Really? <laughs> because I've been, I've been throwing hundreds of seeds out my window for however many months, you know? And then it got warm and some of them sprouted. And I remember like running them over with my lawnmower because I was so panicked I was going to get busted. <laughs> so the first time I ever grew, I, it was on accident. And then as soon as I saw them, I intentionally killed them. Because it was not going to go over well at my house. Um, and that's another point maybe I should make too. Is that like some people grew up in a friendly weed environment. My parents didn't smoke at all. So if I needed to get away with smoking. It had to be completely hidden. I had to take the dog on a walk. You know. Maybe I had to bring some like. You know some gum or something. To like take it off my breath. I had to take a bunch of steps. In order to get away with it. Um, because my parents are cool, you know, but they just weren't, they weren't weed people. They weren't, you know, we lived in a police state at the time. Um, and so as a teenager, it all had to be totally clandestine. God, you're taking me back now when you say that. I, I love it, you know, and, uh, it makes me think maybe, um, you know, the dog walker should have been named after you. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, you just needed to get out like that's, you know, I, I got real religious. My parents were all stoked on me because when I was 16, 17, whatever, in high school, I'd walk the dog religiously. Big, long walks. You know, he's a little overweight. He needed to walk. My parents thought I was like really doing a, a big good deed. And I get a couple blocks away from the family and I'd spark up my bowl and off we went. Right. So, um, yeah, growing weed was uh, 
was just a way like I needed, I could get weed if I went to dead shows. Um, but if I didn't go to a dead show, there was some people I knew in Chicago that I could get weed from, but only occasionally. And this, this is going to make you laugh, right? But let's say you knew somebody that had a three lighter. Okay. The person that bought that off that person, they would go through and whatever they wanted to keep, they would pick out of like, say the three or four pounds they got, they would pick out the nicest pound out of the three nug by nug. <laughs> and then they would sell the rest and then your buddy would get it and he would do the exact same thing. So I might only be like two people away from the grower, but everything I got was a small. Yeah. Okay. Because it was so in demand, right? That like, didn't matter what it was. Like it was 50 to 50 bucks an eighth, hundred bucks a quarter for anything better than Mexican. What an age. And it was hard to get. And it was, it was hard to get. And so part, I think that's actually, if, if it would have been prevalent around me and it would have been easy to get, and I would have had been, had multiple plugs or I would have had someone to teach me. I learned how to grow weed by reading books over and over and over again. I didn't know anything about electricity. I didn't know anything about wiring. I didn't know anything about air movement. I was growing in apartments in Chicago. I had to figure out a way to get, to get away with it. Um, you know, my Amsterdam trips were to begin in 90, we went in 94, uh, we went most years between 94 and 04 is when I stopped. But for a good 10 year period, most years we went once or twice a year on a seed buying trip, um, and to party basically. (laughs) And, uh, that was where I knew, you know, dead shows and Holland were where I knew to get good weed. That's brilliant. And just specifically, when you went on those seed hunting trips, are there any real memorable standout seeds, like something that really impressed you or maybe something that even lived on until today? Uh, sure. You know, um, the I don't know if you've heard me talk about or you've seen on my page what I post, the what I, we call the Maui. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Maui, we got it. Uh, I think... I think it was 1990. It was probably 1994, 1994-ish. So it's probably 29 years old now. Um, that was gotten on a trip over there. Uh, probably the best thing that I ever personally popped of what I bought over there was uh, Black Domina. Um, and it sadly did not live. I got, I, got in, I got in trouble a couple times and it got lost once. And I have not been able to find it again. But as far as like my personal seed pops of going over there, probably the, my favorite thing I ever found from Holland Genetics that I personally purchased was Black Black Domina. And I got it the first year it came out. I think I got it in like December of 96 or something like that. It had just been released that fall. Uh, and I found a killer one. It was really, really potent. Tasted like black pepper. Uh, it was really enjoyable smoke. I miss it quite a bit, actually. Um, and I was dumb too, dude. I should have probably bought two or three things and bought like 50 to 80 seeds of each. Right. But instead I'd bring home like 15 packs of one or two of each of each of it. Right. So you have like 10 or 12 seeds, you know, or 15 seeds or eight seeds or whatever. And then you get like five girls and then you don't find what I need, what you wanted. If I was smarter and I was older, if I was doing it today and that shit still existed, I'd be buying 50 to 80 seeds of each and probably only buying two or three things and like coming home and giving myself 20 or 30 or 35 females to look through. Yeah, right. Hindsight's twenty twenty for sure. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, some of that stuff like back in the day when we were first getting it, you know, we killed all the males. We didn't make seed. That didn't occur to us at the time. It was like the way that you did it is you got seed and you picked out the best females and you killed everything else. Look, that's almost the perfect segue to talk about the Mendo perps, but I'm going to resist the urge to jump there and try to keep us in chronological order. So do you remember what it was you were first growing when you started growing? Yeah. I mean, the very first weed I ever got, it was a, I actually, it's really weird how the internet works, but I reconnected with someone um, who was friends with Johnny winter back then. Um, and in that same group of people. And, um, he told me that the crystal chunk is some kind of, he doesn't remember which one, but he said it's some kind of NL or NL hybrid that they bought from the seed bank 
uh, back then. Oh, wow. And I don't have it anymore. I have some seed, some old seeds of it that a friend gave me. I don't have this, the clone anymore. Um, but that was the very first, um, kind bud strain I ever grew was I grew a couple, I grew a light of crystal chunk. And then shortly after that, we did an Amsterdam trip and, uh, I get, we got some various different strains. We started seed popping and we got the, the Maui ended up popping up in our group and that, that obviously still exists. Um, so, uh, yeah, that, that was, that was kind of like, that was what we were going as far as like trading with other people, dude, like I, two other people besides myself knew I was even growing in Chicago. Yeah. I would like to keep it that crazy, like to make sure that I didn't get in trouble. I would literally be at parties and I would buy an eighth off my friend who I sold a pound to. Wow. So that way I did it in public. Right. And that way a bunch of friends would see, Oh, this is why Francis, that, this is why not so has this week. Yeah. Okay. I love that. Right. Because this is, this is, this is why I saw him. He, he bought a quarter. He bought an eighth. Of course he's got the same stuff. It's from dude. Right. But then if you do that in public, I can't be the grower. Bit of social engineering at its finest. Why, why would I be buying it? So the world that you came into where like there's connectivity and there's people trading cuts and there's access to cuts and all that type of stuff. That was zero. My world. Like we had our small little group of friends that had that that like were all the same age that had a few cuts and we went to Amsterdam, we got some seed and then my buddy ended up moving to Colorado and that sort of expanded things a little bit. Um, that's where I got introduced to the color the, to what people call the cough, um, the wheelchair, the question mark, um, the Hong Kong, um, that kind of thing. <clears throat> and then. I moved out to Mendocino County, which is a whole kind of crazy story in itself. But I moved out to Mendocino County in the late 90s. And then eventually stuff really started shifting for me. I met uh, Staten Island. I ended up getting the super skunk and the and the chem dog. Um, I started trading with various people in Mendo and getting some different stuff. And that's kind of like the, the journey that began. Wow, you definitely preempted my next question, which I was going to ask. Which came first, meeting Staten Island or, or moving to uh, Mendocino? Oh, I guess you sort of answered it, but the, my question still remains. What was it like when you first moved to Mendo? Was it like, were things big and popping off, or was it still like that old world vibe that like Mean Gene talks about, where you know, like there was just these old Afghans and NLs, and like not too much more was discussed beyond that because it was just good weed? Um. I would say that's true. So I, I kind of came into like, uh, me and Gene and I have chatted about it a bit, you know? Um, and I came out to, to Mendo in a really weird way. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I've told this story publicly. I'll, I'll give kind of an abridged version of it, but I had, um, my partner, uh, and by partner, I mean like my, uh, my ex, she got cancer when we were, in our early twenties. Okay. And in back in Illinois, there is no, like, uh, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but there is no like universal health coverage here. Okay. Uh, there's zero. It's pretty much Darwin. Um, like if you were to get into like an accident and break your leg or you were to have some kind of crazy emergency, they'll take care of you. But if you need like dialysis or you need chemo or something like that, um, you're pretty much out of luck. Um, so I was in this situation where I was totally in love with her and she was sick and I needed to figure out a way to help her. And so I started hustling and doing all these various things, trying to earn enough money that I could afford the surgery she needed and the chemo that she needed. Right. And the chemo, I was like a grateful dead hippie dude. So I was like a million percent against doing any kind of radiation or any kind of chemo. I was absolutely convinced it was poison. And then the doctor pulled me aside and he was like, look, man, he goes, if you do this right now, she has probably like a, probably a 90% chance of complete remission. And I went home and I was like, man, you know, 90% is pretty good, right? If someone tells you, you have a 90% chance of getting what you want. You, if you do this thing, you'd probably do the thing, right? So, 
I, um, we did the, we did the chemo and it worked. It was, she went into remission, but I don't know if you know much about women's sizes. She was about a size seven when she started, she was throwing up a whole bunch and she couldn't keep food down and she was dropping weight like crazy. And she ended up being like a double zero in size. Like she was just wasting, she was wasting away and they went through every, every anti-nausea medicine known to man, all this different shit. None of it was working. And so this guy, this doctor, this oncologist that we had, he was like an old Roman Catholic Italian guy. And we were obviously grateful dead hippies. Okay. And he looks at me and he goes, do you guys smoke weed? And I was like, I smoke weed. And he goes, you know, we've tried everything else. Maybe before she comes in and she does her chemotherapy, you guys could smoke a bunch of weed because we've tried everything else and nothing's really worked. So I'm not really supposed to say this, but you know, I've heard a little bit that maybe it can control nausea and it it's, so why don't you give it a shot? So we would wake up and we would watch the prices, Bob Barker and the prices, right. And we would smoke joints and, and pull bongs. And I would get her hellaciously baked before these chemo treatments. Right. And she stopped vomiting and she started gaining weight. Okay. That's incredible. And it was literally like, a, it was literally like a fucking miracle. Like she went from a size seven down to a double zero back up to a size five, all from weed. So this is probably, I don't know, this is probably 1996. And I had some, at this point, Jerry Garcia had died and there was no more dead to her. And I had friends that had ended up in Mendocino County growing weed that I knew from a couple friends that I knew from dead tour. And in November of 96, um, my buddy called me up and he said, dude, it's time for you to move. And I was like, what do you mean? And he was like, we just passed the first medical marijuana law in the entire United States. We voted and it went through, it passed. And he goes, there's only five things that it covers. And one of them is cancer and chemotherapy. He's like, so you can come out here with your lady and you can grow weed and you are safe. They won't put you in jail for it. So it took a little time, but you know, in 97 or whatever, we pretty much started shifting our life and figuring stuff out. And we moved out the following year, um, into Mendocino County. And, um, that's how I got out here, uh, in a, in a, in a totally random way. And she went into remission and, uh, got completely healthy and I loved it out here and she absolutely hated it. And she wanted to move back to Chicago and our relationship did not last. And so she moved back to Illinois and, uh, I stayed in California in Mendocino County and I've been here since. And what's weird about that is that at one point, Mendocino County had the most liberal and forward thinking um, cannabis laws in the country. I was actually part of the sheriff's department's medical marijuana program. We were vetted, her and I, through the Department of Health. I had a, I had a, a Mendocino County Sheriff's Department and, and Mendocino County Department of Health laminated membership card that said I was allowed to carry up to two pounds on my person and I was allowed to legally smoke cannabis and consume cannabis and grow it for our personal use. And we were part of the part, we were part of the pilot program that they started. And fast forward a number of years, I was part of that program. I think it was until Oh four, the federal government threatened to come in and take um, all of the records that Mendocino County had on who was in their medical marijuana program. And at the time our, uh, our sheriff was so hardcore, he canceled the program and burned the records so that the feds couldn't have access to them. So that was how I ended up in Mendocino County. And if you wanted to segue into the Mendo Perp story, it's got a pretty good tie to that, actually. Lead the way, my friend. I just want to quickly say what a what a beautiful story of the uh, the benefits cannabis can have for people battling cancer. But please, please lead on. So um, I, had a, I had a friend of mine who was blowing glass at a time when blowing glass was pretty lucrative and mostly only hippies knew how to do it. Right. 
and he was trying to set up an actual real glass studio in his in his shop that he had on his property which because you got to realize at the time a lot of the early glass blowers like actually ended up damaging their lungs fuming gold and silver and not realizing that they needed to have proper ventilation okay and they ended up breathing in heavy metals and doing some damage to themselves and so he wanted to build this um basically this hvac system that would pull you know a certain amount of air away from the station that he was working <clears throat> and uh and not toxify him right <clears throat> so he hires this guy uh who is a retired hvac guy and he ended up being sick and he had cancer and so he was kind of going through the same thing my ex was going through. And so I felt really bad for him. And I ended up, um, I ended up giving him a chunk of water hash and I don't know, two, three ounces of weed or something like that. And he had, and I was like, I just hope this helps you the way it helped my lady. Right. And he was like, man, I can't afford this. And I'm like, I don't, honestly, I don't care. You can just have it. Right. You're helping us do this HVAC thing. You're struggling for your health and your life. I'm doing fine. You know, take a little hash, take, take some weed. You're good. And he felt embarrassed. And I was like, just, just, just do it. Like if it helps you, it helps you. I, I, I need zero from you. Okay. So fast forward a week and he goes, man, you know, I used to grow back in the day, but I haven't done it in a while. And I was digging in my closet and I found this little thing of seed and I thought, maybe this is a way, maybe you'd accept this as payment if you won't take any money or any work or anything like that. And so he gave me two seats and, uh, I sprout these things up and they both pop and I'm growing them up and one ends up being a girl and one ends up being a boy. Okay. And I was having a friend of mine back then, mostly we grew in bedrooms, right? It was pretty clandestine. So, we're growing in this bedroom and I'm having a friend of mine help me set up a bedroom because I had a three bedroom house. I lived in one room. One room was veg and one room was, was flower. Right. And, uh, I had him help me hang up all these, these lights in this room and set up this veg. So we get this veg set up. I move all my plants in there. I go in there the next morning and one of the lights, you know, the old school metal sharp, uh, hood, one of the lights he had put one of the one of the wood hooks into the ceiling, but it had only gone in the drywall. He'd missed the stud. And as the night went on, it fell out of the thing and it swung down and it chopped the male off at the base. Oh my God. And it was just laying there on the ground wilted. So I'm like, Oh man, well at least they, I'm like in my mind, I'm like, at least they killed the boy. Okay. So I have this one girl. So I bloom this girl out and you got to realize this is the late nineties. So, this is way before Urkel or anything like that. And so all of a sudden I get this like crazy smelling royal purple looking cannabis and I am tripping out. I've never seen anything quite like it. And so I take it to dude and I'm like, is this what you, what is this? And he looks at it and he goes, man, I didn't think that even existed still. And I was like, what is it? And he goes, I don't know. He's like, but the only time I grew purple weed was like the summer of 77 in Covalo which Covalo is a little uh, remote uh, town in Mendocino County, uh, tucked away in the middle of nowhere, right? So the seeds were basically 20, 21-year-old seeds that he had just tossed in a cold closet in Laytonville and ignored. And um, he died that following year. So I never really got more information off it besides that. But that is literally how... The way I got the Mendo perps is I gave a cancer patient um, some hash and some weed to help him out. And he gifted me back a couple of seeds. And that's how I got the perps. What an incredible sort of real organic story. I love that, you know, just someone helping another person out and the universe rewards you for that indirectly. That's that's beautiful. Did you have any idea it would go on to become what it is now? And I think I have to preface this by acknowledging I think Mendo Perps is still kind of coming into its prime, especially with all the work Caleb's been doing. I think it's even still like, it's not like, oh, it was big and it fell off. I think it's still gaining momentum. But what's your perspective? I would say that as a part of the reason why when you talk to people, dude, that 
the stories are so funny and they don't always line up is a lot of times it was young kids that had no idea that anything that they were doing was ever going to be talked about or be important again. Sure. Right. I mean, think about, think about for a second, think about a uh, chem dog popping the chem 91 when he was 17. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hugely unmemorable in the moment. Just, you know, and that's part of why some of the stories with Sour Diesel or with Kush or with Chemdog or with whatever get so convoluted is because nobody knew that they needed to be, that they were going to be asked on a granular level what happened, right? So, no, I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, we, um, I knew it was special because at the time I had never seen purple weed before like that it's not like there was no purple weed that's silly there's plenty of afghans and mendo and stuff like that that um will turn purple in the cold especially you know you get some a a cold snap and fall as they're ripening or something like that and they'll purple right up but for me at least in my experience in my realm um that was the first thing i ever grew that like in a 75 degree indoor room would just turn dark purple and it just smelled wild right and So, um, we loved it and I passed it around to good friends. It's kind of a crazy story how CSI got it, uh, because, you know, but I'd let him tell that aspect of it, but it, it was, it, it's, I think it was sort of, it was pre purple. There was pre, pre, um, the perp, the first purple wave that really got popular. Um, and it only spread out so far, but we did make some hybrids with it. And those hybrids that we made, Um, one of them was intentional. We crossed, um, this Durban poison line we had to, uh, the Mendo P and called it anise because it smelled very much like licorice. Uh, and that has gone on to make a number of different things. And then, um, I had this strain called the effects. Okay. E F E F E X. And I got it actually, you know, I'm sure you know who Tim Blake is, right? Yeah. Um, Tim Blake is actually the first person that ever showed me a 90 lighter, uh, way back when. And, uh, I became friends with him. I used to go to his house and he'd throw like, he'd throw events at his, at his spot and he'd have music and food and, you know, they'd pound music all night and have a good time and such. And his worker gave me this cut that, that some people called garlic bud and some people called effects. And I was growing a room at my friend's house um, that had effects right next to Cemento perps. It was summertime. The, uh, air conditioner went out. It took me a couple of days to fix it. And that amount of time, the Mendo perps hermed, it hermed all over the effects. And I got a bunch of purple effects seats. Um, and that was, that was my first feminized breeding totally on accident, not, not intentional. Um, and that strain actually, you can see it. I think it's in the second can of Bible, uh, purple effects, and it's gone on. It's in a number of modern strains today. Like it's in the Sprite. It's in the Rosé. Um, it's in a few different things that people have used over the years. Um, I don't have it anymore. I lost it and the seeds in a bust, but it percolates around. Yeah. Wow. That's a that's a really cool story. And and could you ever have imagined that like, you know, the Mendo Perp was what led the way for these things, plus a plethora of other strains. Like you know, I, I know that. On Breeder Syndicate, I, I mentioned that, um, you know, the Mendo Breath was one that I feel like I see a lot of the Mendo Perps within that strain, even though there's a few generations removed. Could you imagine that, like, not only might it be used in things, but even multiple generations later, you can still really sort of see it shining through? I can. Uh, and the reason is, is that the one thing that um, makes me think that my that the guy was telling me the truth, okay, is think about 1977, that would have been, um, like I was saying earlier in the show, that was sort of like the first couple of years that Afghans were started to make their way into Humboldt and, and Mendocino County and spreading out a bit amongst the grower community. And the, the only reason why I think it could possibly be true is that it's pretty low THC, but it's very, it's very much within the range of what most things THC-wise were in that era. Um, and it's got a very, when you S1 it, when, uh, CSI is S1'd it, 
Um, it's got an extremely wide gene pool in there. It's definitely not narrow. It's very broad. Lots and lots of different things pop out in those S1s, uh, much more broad than most strains. And it's got, I don't want to say it's got unique terps because I don't think there is unique things in cannabis, but I do think that it might be unique to what we know today in the sense that almost anything I've ever smelled that smells like Mendo perps, I find that it ties back to Mendo in some way, right? And I would say that Mendo is probably a better breeder than it is as an actual plant itself. Um, I think it's children um, or even some of its S1s can be nicer than the mother plant. I love the mother plant, but it's got some things I really adore but it's also missing a couple of things that I wish it had. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, and there's a weird thing where people don't like to give credit. You know, they, like you were saying before, everyone wants to walk out with their strain and have it be like it, it, cre and it, it, I created this out of nothing. So I can understand how a bunch of people don't want to give up their secret sauce. But it, what I do think is cool is that, uh, way beyond anything that I had to do with it, the biggest contribution you can make in cannabis is to get some hybrids out there or to get some crosses out there or to get some seed pops that you happen to be a part of out there. And that those things are valuable enough that other people, most of which don't even know you or might not even know that you exist, find valuable enough in that weed to keep breeding and growing and smoking it. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And that's why I always try to mention to people, you know, I think there's nothing more you know, there's nothing more to be grateful for as a breeder than when someone dedicates some space and time in their grow to growing your workout, especially if it's multiple times, you know, it's, it's a real testament. Yeah. I mean, think about like, you know, when people, when you were talking about how people get mad that people steal their work, right? Well, you know, what's worse is, uh, everyone saying, man, that sucks. I would never work with you. <laughs> it's actually a compliment to have someone to have someone use your stuff. And maybe it's even a bigger compliment if they like it so much, they want to obscure where it comes from and say and make up their own story about it because it's so good. They want to they, they want that like rep or whatever that comes with it to like come to them instead of you. Right. Because everyone's going to be forgotten, dude. You know, like we're all just passing through a bit. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, like you were talking about, like, you know, what do you think strains will be remembered? Hopefully, some of the breeders now are making good enough work that some of their stuff still exists or at least is blended into the modern stuff that exists then. That's really the goal of breeding, right, is like to leave a genetic imprint and to maybe improve what you found in certain ways and pass it on to the next group. For sure, for sure. Maybe in uh, 20 years, we'll still have rainbow belts. There you go, Fletcher. I gave you a good one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's entirely possible. I, mean, I don't even... You know, I don't even like cookies very much, but it's certainly um, it's certainly a big part of uh, and, and a permanent part of the community. And I'll say this, too, like you were talking about Caleb and his and, you know, most of the time, Caleb told me when when he meets people that are actually the originator of whatever strain that they're using, he's using. They get upset at him and they want some kind of compensation or they want some kind of shout out or they want rep because he's using their thing. Right. He said, I was like the only guy that was like just super stoked that um, he was doing all these really cool things with the Mendo P because I do think that no one is more is going to be more responsible for making sure that those genetics don't get lost than him. He's made more hybrids with it and he's popular enough that so many of those hybrids have sold and he's made a bunch of S1s and he's made it so that even if him and I or somebody else lost the mother cut, that it's probably a permanent addition to the gene pool because it's been mixed. It's been mixed into enough things. It's going to survive in some form. Yeah, definitely. That's that's a great way to view it. And um, I, I wanted to just quickly loop back to the other thing we mentioned a few questions ago, which was. You know, you said you moved to Mendo and then shortly after you met Staten Island and you got exposed to the dog and the super skunk. How was it exactly that you met Staten Island? And when you did meet him, was he already in the thick of like 
the Chem 91 and the Super Skunk fandom or was it still like he'd only just sort of got them? Like, where was it when you sort of stepped in? Um, well, I would, so, you know, memories vary on this one a little bit, but it seems like, um, it seems like he got both, let's say sometime in 1994. Okay. Um, and then he brought them back to California. Uh, it seems like, um, skunk VA was still traveling with the grateful dead then. And so he didn't start growing, I don't think, until after Jerry, Jerry died in August of 95. And it seems like, um, you could ask him, I suppose, but it seems like after Jerry died, he, I believe he quit touring right away because there was no more tour. And he came out um, and, get, and uh, Staten gave him um, some super skunk and he started growing that and i believe those polaroids that he posts on his page are from those very first few grows that he ever did okay and so i think um i want to say that maybe he got it from staten island in maybe 95 uh, late 95 maybe early 96 um and then i see collective uh graduated high school in 97 and he ended up moving in with skunk va and so that's, I think he got access to it, um, by that aspect. And then I got it the following year from Staten Island, um, in 1998. And, uh, we just met randomly and, um, smoked each other's weed and really enjoyed it. And then I ended up going down and having some dinners at his house. He lived in Sonoma County at the time, um, with his, with his lady that became his wife, uh, and we just ended up, we just ended up becoming really good, close friends. And so he, he was a stickler and he, um, really was very intent upon n none of these things ever leaking. Uh, but for whatever reason, he decided to give them to me. Um, and so I got the skunk and the, uh, and the chem dog from him. And, uh, I've had the chem dog since I had the skunk for a number of years. I lost it. I don't know, maybe nine years, eight, eight, nine years after that, something along those lines. And, uh, I got, I got in trouble and, uh, they got cut down and I was the last person I knew that had it. So that was that. But I will say that there was zero fame around those cuts. Um, there was nothing of the legend that you guys know of. There was nothing of the, uh, like, I think that uh, I don't think that they even started getting popularized very much until Skunk VA went on the forums in 06, maybe, or maybe it was 05. Um, but for the first, I don't know, half a decade I had it, uh, it was just like some super fire weed that we had and, uh, Staten Island wouldn't let me get, wouldn't let me give it to anyone. So nobody else could have it. Ah, huh, that's, that's so interesting. And so most of the stories that I believe are the ones that I heard earliest, right? Yeah. Um, because obviously there's, you know, you know, fame gets into it and different people get into it and people start arguing about time and stuff. And so, you know, I, I came up, you know, do I know it's origin stories a hundred percent? You know, there's obviously some debate back and forth on that, but I got it pretty early from Staten Island, um, just by being good friends with him. And the whole super dog project was, um, also just something that happened because I was good friends with him and him and I were doing some stuff together. And, um, you know, that whole, the whole like beginning of that really was that I don't think this is particularly well known. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but after Staten had given the skunk to, um, to chem dog on the east coast and then brought the skunk and the chem and the dog out west um chem dog called him later and said dude the first time i grew this stuff it hermed the skunk hermed all over the chem dog and i got seeds and i'm growing those seeds and they're better than both of them so the whole start of his idea to like create the super dog was basically trying to combine those strains into one line. But you got to remember back then that was so long before 
there was reversals or we even knew that reversals existed. So in order to like even make the line happen, it was like you had to be X, you know, it's almost like you had, you had to get a pollen source somewhere because the two clones that we wanted to cross were both girls. We just had a single clone of each. Right. And I knew nothing. We knew nothing about reversals. We knew, in fact, back then we thought that hermaphroditic seed was cheating and it would fuck up your seed line by making more hermaphrodites. So uh, we didn't know anything about reversals or feminized breeding or any of any of any of that kind of stuff. So he ended up taking the super skunk and he ended up crossing it um, to a male. And then I think we took that. I think he took that to F3, something like that, selecting for uh, skunk traits and then I believe, if I remember correctly, um, we might, it might, there might have been a, a back cross of that back onto the, the skunk cut itself. And then pollen from that got thrown on the dog, and that became super dog. That's interesting. I didn't know there was that outcrossing step. But I'd love to ask you, whatever happened to the super dog? Because, you know, like we, we spoke to Skunk BA recently and he also sort of had fond memories of the strain. And so it got me wondering, like, was there any specific reason no one held on to a cut or anything? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. So, like I said before, 99% of people won't hold a cut unless it's currently popular. Right? So people, plenty of people held it and plenty of people grew it. Most people just didn't hold it for a long time. Okay. And, uh, you know, there was as far as, gosh, this gets kind of tricky, but I'll just say it. So I gave all that stuff I gave to Mandelbrot, which was basically a um, pure super dog and then a bunch of super dog hybrids that uh, Staten Island and I had made Staten Island. And I, the final stage of super dog that we did was we took seven or eight males combined with our favorite females of super dog. So I think there was seven and seven, seven and seven of each. We put those in a room and then we put it in there with like every single cut of quality cannabis that we had at the time, which was, Mendo perps, super skunk, the dog, um, black, black domina, the warlock, um, the Maui, all kinds of different things. We put them, we put everything, every good cutting we had, we threw it in there on eight lighter and we just let the pollen fly and we just pollinated eight lights, which is using, making regular seed with copious amounts of pollen is a ginormous amount of seed, right? So after that, we had a ton, we had a ton of seed. I gave a bunch to Mandelbrot. And the only thing that I asked was that if you found anything cool, give it back to me. Or if anything ever happened and I needed it, give it back to me. Um, and neither one of those two things happened. So um, the Mandelbrot story, I don't really want to get into detail too much about all that because it's a little, I just, you know, he was my buddy and we had, we had some issues over it. I will say that, you know, he had a little ego that went to his head and he didn't want to share and he didn't want to admit where some of it came from. Um, we had kind of a falling out over it. And then we met randomly in Ukiah. We bumped into each other and we kind of had a heart to heart about it. And he told me he was going to give me back um, some some selections he had made and he'd give me back some seed and we were going to be all good. And then with before that actually happened, within a couple of months, um, he unexpectedly passed away. And, uh, when he passed away, um, I don't know exactly what happened, but it, it seems like people went into his grow room and people went into his seed stock and a lot of that stuff disappeared, put it that way. So then that left me and Staten Island. We each had a bunch of seed. Um, and, uh, <sighs> I had jars and jars and jars, like mason jars full of hybrids of it, dude. And I had it stashed in a couple different places in my house. And um, I got busted. I think it was in early 09. I got raided. And uh, they took all my seed. 
and they actually flushed it down the toilet. I don't usually tell that story very much, but um, I got handcuffed to a uh, to a computer chair, and they wheeled me in front of the bathroom, and then they took all these seeds and they opened up each mason jar and they poured it into the toilet while they were waiting for the paddy wagon and they flushed all the seed down the toilet. Jesus, what's that? Death by torture. <laughs> and so then shittily, right in that same time period, um, Staten Island went on vacation and he had all of his seeds stored in a fridge in his garage. And someone had plugged something else into, into, into an outlet and it popped the outlet while he was on vacation and so the fridge stopped working and they ended up the whole time he was on vacation, which I think was two or three weeks, they ended up in a 115 degree garage unrefrigerated. Oh, RIP. And so we had, he had jars and jars of seed. We tried all these different ways to make them pop. They wouldn't pop. We passed them to friends. We did all this stuff about scuffing them and soaking them and peroxiding them, and seed cracking them and Every once in a while, we'd get like a tail that would pop out, um, and then it would just not continue and die. And uh, he actually had all that seed, um, thousands and thousands of seeds, but we just couldn't make anything happen with them. And then in 2017, we had those massive California fires, and his house burned down. So we lost them. So um, there's an uh, Emerald Mountain legacy, Ben who is uh, Mandelbrot's younger brother. Um, he has some stuff that has like some of that stuff worked in it. I don't know if out there, you know, supposedly there's a cut called The Truth um, that is Superdog by Maui um, that exists that I haven't grown. Um, but it's a selection that Mandelbrot made out of uh, Superdog by Maui seeds that I gave him that exists. Um and if you look in the in the second can of Bible, the red one, um, there's a bunch of pictures of the Superdog, Superdog 7, Superdog 3, some of the phenos I selected. But uh, yeah, four or five years of work through uh, busts, uh, cops, fire, and uh, uh, popping circuits, we lost the line. Man, that's, that's heartbreaking to hear. But, you know, sort of speaking to your point earlier... Um... You know, nothing more of an honor than to have someone want to use your work, I guess. And, and hopefully, you know, you get something that reminds you of it. I'd love to ask while I got you here, what do you think is the lineage on the chem dog? You know, the much speculated and guessed at. Do you have any ideas yourself? So I think it's, I might get in trouble for saying this, but this is kind of how I see it, right? So um, Joe B and Peabud were older cats and they were on dead tour and they were buying and selling weed, right? It was very common for people to buy weed, say a half pound, a quarter pound, a couple pounds, <clears throat> take it on dead tour and sell it in chunks. And that's what paid for their tickets and their life and their partying and having a good time, right? So these guys are buying and selling weed all the time on dead tour. They buy weed, they give it to, they, they sell a bunch of it. Um, some of it goes to a 17 year old kid. Okay. And then that's in 1991. Peabody and Joe B don't figure out that anything came of those seeds until the forum era. Oh, five, oh, six. So literally 15 years goes by without them having anything to do with the chem story. Okay. And then they're asked, Hey, do you remember 15 or 16 years ago? That one week when you were in Indiana, do you remember what the weed was like that you had and in, in, that you were buying and selling then? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's a big ask for a non-memorable event, right? Right. It just it was like it was one. It was like not only was a non-memorable event, but like they didn't even realize that anything came of it for a decade and a half. And so I've I definitely I've heard people talk. I don't even want to say some of the rumors. I think that, um, I think that we just won't ever know. Uh, I have a bunch of theories about it. Um, some people get mad at me for talking about the theories because, you know, the the chem D and the chem dog and the, the one through the four and all these different things are all supposed to be from the same exact seeds, which everyone assumes that they're sisters. Right. But 
What if in that ounce there were like I was talking about before, what if there was multiple phenos in that ounce? Yeah, that's what I've always thought. What if some of them were hybrids and some of them were S1s? What if there was even more than one source of pollen? I mean, we just don't know. And the people that we know that gave dude the weed, they weren't even the growers. They were middlemen buying weed from someone and then taking it on dead tour and parceling it out to make money. What I will say is that I do think that um, just by growing it for a long time and crossing it to a bunch of stuff and seeing it, I do think that the Mendo, or I do think that the 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 Chem 91, I think it's already an S1. Hmm. Ah, okay. Interesting. And so that way, like when Caleb or somebody like that, when you, when you S1 it, I think part of the reason why it looks so uniform and there's like not very much variation going on there at all <clears throat> is it's already an S2. Yeah, okay, just cuz like the results the progeny give. Mhm. Mm just because of how narrow like if you were like remember how I was talking about how I thought like the the Mendo P might be land race because when you S1 it it's so wide. Like, and you see so many different expressions and, and size and, and colors and nose and all these different things. The Chem 91 is the opposite of that. Almost all of it looks extremely similar to the Chem 91. There's very little physical. There's some potency differences. There's actually some S1s that are even more potent than the mom. Um, that strain... Uh, CSI has told me he thinks that nothing in his entire collection passes on potency as consistently as that cut. Yeah. But it, but it just kind of is what it is. Like when you try to go through a bunch of S ones, you're not going to find a bunch of wildly different things. Yeah, that's interesting. And I've certainly heard you guys mention that before. And I've used that in some of the seed selections I'm making, you know, because I thought to myself, all right, if the 91 really consistently passes on potency, maybe I should try to get crosses where the other parent is like really terpy or something. Because like if it's going to pretty consistently bring potency, maybe like a, a forbidden fruit cross chem 91 is sort of like the go to, you know, in terms of getting like a nice, well-rounded sort of plant. Now that is real breeding. So what I think happens in breeding today is people try to take two things that are already popular, but you probably don't have access to and combine them. And then you get hybrids of them, right? In my opinion, real breeding is like, there's these qualities in this one plant and there's these qualities in this other plant. And I wonder if I can get them in the same plant by making, making seeds with them. Can I get these, can I get these qualities from over here and these qualities from over here and can they combine? And that to me is breeding, right? So yeah, anything you wanted to add potency to, um, you know, the 91 will do that. You know, it also, you know, add its look too. um, you know, which is, uh, kind of that old dark olive dinosaur looking weed, um, it's one of my favorite strains still it's well stood up to the test of time. It has probably my favorite Indica high. Um, I adore it. Um, not everyone thinks it's a favorite, but I personally love it a whole bunch. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. I wanted to quickly ask you before I forget, cause it's like a fleeting moment, but, uh, when we spoke to Skunk VA recently, he mentioned that there was this cutting that went around sort of in the 2000s. It was a super silver haze. And he was like, oh, man, it went around the bay. It was, it was actually pretty memorable. I wish we still had that one. Did you ever get exposed to that one? Slash, what's your thoughts on the Super Silver Haze in general? I like Super Silver Haze. Um, you know, Super Silver Haze, in Neville's opinion, was kind of an imp improved Jack Herrera. It's basically a blend of haze, skunk, and northern lights, right? Uh, and so, you know, in that regard, um, there's a lot of variation in there depending on which ones. I had one. I lost it in the fire. I had one that was, um, you can still see some pictures of it on my page, that I loved a whole bunch. I don't think it was like elite, 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 but it was really nice weed. It smelled really good. It was really frosty. It threw chunks all over itself. I like that line. I like the mango haze line a little better, um, but it's one of those ones that you might have to look through a lot to find what you really adore. 
but it's in there somewhere. And sometimes, you know, you can look as much as you want and you won't find what you're looking for. Uh, and sometimes it's easy to find it and sometimes it takes work. And I think the super silver haze that are really good takes work, but they exist. Um, and I, so yeah, there's very, there's various phenos of it that float around that I think are quite nice. And I'm a fan. That's awesome to hear that you, uh, you know, got a soft spot for the, um, the mango haze. That's one that, you know, it's actually very popular in Australia. A lot of the older dudes really vibe on it and, haven't really seen it represented as much in the states outside of um what's his name you know mango the the guy from florida but um yeah really stoked 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 to hear that yeah mango i mean mango haze and um super silver haze are sisters um they're very closely related so um mang super silver haze is c5 cross to um a skunk haze okay and mango haze is a sister of that C5. He, Neville called it the 122 cross to the same dad. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Does that make sense? So they share, so mango haze and super, super silver haze share the same father, and the mothers are, are full sisters. Wow. So yeah, they're, they're very closely related. They're very closely related, indeed. It's just that they actually called the 122 the mango in Holland. That was one of its nicknames um, because it had that mercine and had some of those terps that were that were like that. And so I actually, if I had to pick, um, Super Silver Haze tends to be much more of a commercial plant. It, it's like got that those skunk colas all over it. It yields really well. It's like bulletproof. Mango Haze is a little hazier to me. It's a little more sativa. It's a little more finicky, but I tend to like the weed better um, than Super Silver Haze on average. I think it's a great strain. Um, I, you know, and I think it might be one of the ones from um, from Shanti's uh, Shanti's company, Mister Nice. It might be one of the ones that he actually still has the real parents of, which is always a big debate. But uh, I I like Mango Haze. It's a good one. Look, while we're on the topic of uh, seeds and what parents might be in them, I want to ask you, you know, sort of a two-parter, but we'll keep it simple to begin with. I've There's been speculation in, you know, the community for a while, but more recently, you know, Matt chucked up the post, which um, sort of openly said that the ChemD may be a Chem91 cross skunk. And I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think there might be any merit to that? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I'm one of the proponents of it. I know it caused some battles, uh, with various, various people that did not like said speculation. Um, but that's what it is. It's speculation, right? Um, what's the harm in speculating? Uh, the reason why I think so is that, you know, um, the, uh, I just see like having grown the chem 91 for a, a really long time now and having a, a pretty long experience with the skunk before I lost it. I just, I personally just see both parents in that plant. Right. And, you know, like we were mentioning about how narrow banded the chem 91 S ones are, um, you know, it's also possible. I mean, uh, JJ and I got into a battle about it not that long ago, top dog, and he was like, well, could it be, you know, he's like, let's say that everything you say is true. Why couldn't it be cis by S by super skunk? And I had to admit that that could be true too. I just don't see that the chem 91, the chem D, the chem four, um, the chem one that still exists, some of these different things. I just don't see them as being able to have the same exact mom and dad. Now, whether that means that like, dude, it's all true and it's the same original 13 seeds and there was like mixed phenos of actual females in that ounce that he had or there was multiple pollen sources or some of the other chems are later hybrids. You know, it's like I'm not there. I don't have any super insight. I can't say. Um, but it is I, I think that um, I think that the chem D is a chem skunk. I just do. 
I, I, the way, the, how green it is, the way it grows, the way it smells, the way it herms. Um, I've just grown it a whole bunch and that would be my guess. And I hoped that phylos or some of these other genetic, you know, offerings that people have done would have started to unlock some of these oral histories and some of these legends and tales that we have and like been definitive, right? Where they can be like, this is absolutely a full sister or this isn't, but we're not there yet. Right. So we don't have verifiable proof one way or the other. We just have, you know, a story about a teenager starting some seeds and, you know, that's all we have. I totally can understand your point of view and that there's so much ambiguity. It's hard to really say for sure. And something that I was thinking about myself is that a comment that sort of lasted with me was when Skunk VA said, none of the super dogs came out like ChemD, you know, so like why would I necessarily believe that that's the lineage? But then what I thought was, if you look at the GMO, we know what the lineage is. ChemD cross cookies. Mamiko has put out a bunch of those seeds. People have popped them and no one has found anything like the GMO. Yeah. And so I thought, what if it's the same with the ChemD and the, the skunk? You know, it's just like a one in a million pheno. I mean, it's kind of like the same thing with Cap, right? When he got famous on the Mac 1 and he sold a ton of Mac 1 seeds and hybrids and nothing came out looking like it, right? Sometimes that happens. And, you know, Caleb and I have this thing where like plants don't lie, people do. Um, most of my stuff that I just told you is just my guesses based on breeding with the plant, growing the plant. No, and the other thing too, is that you got to remember when skunk VA was talking about the super dog, when I kind of gave that quick, um, rundown of what happened with it, it's not like the super dog was a pure super skunk by chem dog. There was steps involved. Right. So we never actually like, you know, maybe if we were doing it 10 years later, we would have just, you know, used some STS or something and reversed one onto the other. But that's not how it happened. Right. So we don't know what. But here's the thing. Right. Is that I have a theory and I'll, I'll just say this. OK. And, I, and like this and this is where like talking about history gets really delicate because. You know, you, you try to tell history and there's history and there's known and there's unknown and there's people that get attached to certain stories. And so I start talking about this and then people are going to be like, oh, people are people are saying, you know, Francis, uh, you know, not so dog is saying that like uh, um, that Greg is a liar, that it's that that I don't believe his story. And that's not what I'm saying. Um, you know, chem dog, two of my all time favorite plants. Uh, the chem 91 and the chem D came out of either, you know, his room or his efforts. Right. So I'm amazingly grateful for that. Right. But you also got to remember and think back to your own experiences. Say he pops this stuff when he's 17. How on it were you between 17 and 22, 23? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, not, not very on it at all. <laughs> not very on it at all. And so could he honestly believe that it's all the same 13 seeds? Absolutely. Could they be? They could, but I have a hard time believing it unless there's multiple moms and dads involved, right? Um, but, you know, there's also like there's some ChemD fakes out there, which has caused its own whole set of series. And I've battled with people on it. So I don't know if we really want to get into that on this thing. But the problem with the chem D fakes is that they all seem to originate from Greg. And so I've had this thought that it's possible that some of those seeds were either, um, you remember how I told you when we, the, for the whole first idea of the super dog was the super skunk accidentally hermed on the chems and he was all excited about it. What if some of that stuff was just seed from that accident? What if, what if it just ended up, he had a box of different seeds and some of it got into a different labeling and he thought it was this and it was this. I don't know. It's all supposition, right? I just know that the 91 and the one and the four and the D are vastly different than one another. Yeah. Look, I have to admit, I've always been a bit uncomfortable about the one, especially it's just so left of field. Yeah. And it just, it, 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 the, the way 
you know, and it's like the, the D is like a short, stocky Afghan thing, you know, that takes nine weeks. The one and the four take 12 or 13 weeks and are big, stretchy, long running colas that throw bats. The 91 is like this mutant, um, old Afghan leafy looking thing, you know, um, they just have very, very different looks and their kids look very different. And, you know, I don't know that I'm not sitting here saying anyone's wrong because I don't know that I'm right. I'm just saying observationally, I see things that make me question. Yeah, of course. And look, I, I, there's so much more I want to ask you about this, but I think we'll, we'll have to save it for a part two. Otherwise, we'll end up going down this uh, rabbit hole forever. But while we're talking about the actual lineage of things, I'm sure you've noticed uh, Caleb's put up a post that he's done this F1 Durban reversal. My yep. question is, do you suspect he's going to find anything similar to cookies in the Derb Cross OG hybrids he's done? So there's there's some interesting stuff in all that. Um, th- that probably, if we want to wrap this up in the next few minutes, I'll keep it pretty short and sweet. Um, but there, you know, he is, uh, he has very different thoughts after, after doing it than he did in the beginning. Um, I gave him the flow rider to use in that, in that cross. Um, I got the flow, right? The only re- I, the flow rider is an OG. I don't know. It could be, you know, um, I don't know if that's its first name or, you know, it's, 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 it's got name changed or whatever, but What I do know is that the person that the cookie accident happened, um, that's the Kush that he had. He gave it to me directly in 04. Um, So I am absolutely convinced that that's the Kush and cookie. Um, So I gave him um, that cut so that he could add it into the F1 Derb room and we could see what what happened. Um, I think that cookie was a multi-stage accident. And uh, I... um, we could talk about that, but that probably would have to be a part two. Uh, yeah, that would that might have to be a part two. Look, we're we're definitely going to have to do it, and I do want to be conscious of your time because I've I've already taken up the best part of four hours. So, how about uh, we do one more question before we get on to the quick fire, and then we'll we'll definitely have to do a part two. But question specifically, I I was thinking about you, and I was like, oh, I'm, this is actually a perfect one for not so dog. Um, uh, you know, when we think about modern breeding, we have this sort of more analytical, more scientific approach these days compared to in the past when it was arguably a bit more intuitive. You know, people were still using science, but, you know, generally speaking, the education was less widespread. And when I think of that sort of breeding, I think of people like DJ Short. And I wonder if DJ Short existed in today's climate as a fledgling breeder, and express some of the zany, some of the more wacky ideas, at least by modern standards, that he has in the past. Do you think there would be, he would get a reception, or do you think he would be sort of laughed out? You know, like because it feels like we've come so far with our understanding of genetics that maybe we might be at risk of losing some of the more left of field ideas. What's your well, thought? You got to realize that most people breeding are breeding for money, so we haven't really advanced all that far in the sense that, and I, and I don't, and I'm painting a broad brush. So there's plenty, there's people out there with passion. There's people out there doing, you know, micro breedings um, of their own stuff and all that. So I'm not trying to lump it in. I'm just trying to talk about like the commercial aspect of breeding right at this particular moment. I don't think we're actually doing very much in the way of breeding right now. There are some people like Fletch or or CSI or different people doing some like multi-stage breeding, I think most of the game is take this, reverse it onto a bunch of well-known cuts, sell, and it's just a one-off and that's it, right? So DJ is interesting in that if you believe his story, he basically created everything out of four plants, right? He had like an Afghan, he had like a, a, he had a, a couple different kinds, he had a Oaxacan that he crossed to a to a tie that he called juicy fruit and he had an Oregon purple tie and that's basically it and so to me I don't think DJ has like a bunch of different lines I think he has like one line 
that he's pulled different expressions out of and then bred with those expressions, if that makes sense. So, um, and, you know, I, I think he probably bottlenecked stuff accidentally early on, too. And, um, you know, I think that the the there's a lot of cool breeding that's going on right now. It's just not for sale, dude. Right? Like, people that are making things for sale are like, okay, so I'm going to take this lemon cherry gelato and I'm going to cross it to Skittles and then I'm going to cross it back to Thin Mint and then here you go. Right? When you're trying to breed, and even if you're somebody doing experiments, like let's let's talk about uh, CSI for a second again, right? He does, you know, reproductions of you know pine tar Kush or or deep chunk or Burmese or these different things or Sterling skunk, right? He does open pollinations. He does that. He did the NL project. He does all that kind of stuff. But that stuff's not his bread and butter. Like his bread and butter is like, you know, Mendo P hybrids and Skittles hybrids and crossing this by this. He has to make enough popular stuff, right, to fund the weird shit that might not have too much commercial value, but still important to make seed of and, and have. Does that make sense? Certainly. I remember Bodhi expressing a similar point, saying a lot of the stuff he offers is not his true passion it's to pay the bills and then on the side he can do the passion projects you know this might be a little good segue but are you familiar with the actor michael kane oh yeah brilliant so i watched you could probably watch it on youtube there's this there's this thing that he gave where he he got this award and he gave this speech and it very much made me feel like it was about breeding even though it was about acting and he basically said look when you're young and you're an actor and you're poor you take any work you can get, right? Doesn't matter how crappy it is. You just take it because you need a job. And then if you do a good job in those things, maybe you get some bigger roles and you're still just taking whatever's on offer. And he goes, and then you get to a point in life where maybe if you've been successful enough, you've got some blockbusters, you've got some big hits, you've got some stuff going on. Maybe you can take a risk on a passion project or something that really makes you feel good. But he's like, then you have to balance that with some big screen production because you're still trying to have a career, right? So he goes, when you're in the movies, maybe every once in a long while you get to really follow your passion when mostly you're just trying to do good work along the way and stay afloat. Yeah, huge parallels. Right? And so that's kind of what I was just talking about is like, like you were saying with me talking to Bodhi or what I was just mentioning about CSI is like in order for him to do these open pollinations, in order for Bodhi to mess around with some like weird ass sativas, he has to release some popular stuff that's going to pay the bills. Yeah. You have to blend it, right? Going out on a limb and making a, that that's what's so cool about being a private breeder, dude, is you can literally do whatever the fuck you want when you don't have to worry about making money off it. It can have herms. It can not yield well. It can have all these problems. It doesn't matter. You're still, you're still doing it for you or your friends, and you're going to look through it. And if you find good weed, you're happy. But if you're going to breed and you're going to sell, right, then you have to take some commercial aspects of that into consideration. And, and so when you, look at, when you look at people, right, like – um, and, I, and I'm not going to like, I'm not trying to call anybody out here by any means, but you remember how I was speaking about how a lot of famous people get into breeding and they kind of breed with what made them famous, right? Like NorCal IC Mag breeds a lot with OGKB because it made him famous. Um, you know, Swamp Boys did a ton with TK because that was kind of their bread and butter. Skunk VA stays pretty close to the chem family of things, Right. And these aren't disses on them, but imagine if Skunk VA was like, hey, I got this weird Laotian sativa from Bodhi and I got this other African thing and I'm going to start doing these weird sativas that I'm not associated with. And he puts in all this time and he puts in all this money and he puts in all this effort and then it sells like shit and he's stuck with like 10,000 seats. There's a commercial aspect to it, right? Where you're trying to figure out what and, and I can tie that back in. So like, even if I'm not talking about breeding, even if I'm just talking about like 
like uh, preserving a large collection of moms or something like that. You still need to do enough stuff that's commercially viable that you can fund your passion. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like it's almost like, um, you know, to be commercially successful, it almost forces you to stay in your own lane. Yeah, it does. It limits you. And then you get known. It's like, um, you know, like take uh, going back into acting. Right. I'll use another example. I remember watching Jackie Chan give an interview uh, on one of the stupid late night talk shows or something. And they were talking about, did he ever want to branch out? And he looks right at the camera and he goes, I would love to branch out. He goes, they want to see me do martial arts and be funny. They don't want to see me in a tender romantic comedy with Jennifer Aniston. Would I do it? Sure. It'd be kind of fun. Do they want to cast me in it? No, they want Hugh Grant. They want, you know, um, they want Brad Pitt. They want Leonardo DiCaprio. They don't want me. I can be in a buddy movie. I can be in a martial arts movie. I can be in a, a comedy maybe, but I can't be in a, in, a, in a romance or a drama that's not where they want to cast me. And I think breeding has parallels to that. Like you, you get known for what you're known for and it's hard to branch out. And if you are going to branch out, what happens if it's a total flop? Yeah. I agree. And look, this perfect segue. This is why we need to all give credit to Berner for casting Bodhi as the head of genetics. You know, he's given Jackie Chan the role in the, the dramatic thriller. Man, I will say, you know, uh, Bodhi was at the party we just had, you know, and uh, he's my buddy. Uh, I will say that um, him and Berner trying to collab, I don't know if it went well for either one of them, in my opinion. Uh, very different fan bases. I just, I hope it transpires through, you know, he said he's, um, you know, trying to get some cool stuff on their menus and uh, there's nothing more I'd love to see than for that to work out. I understand why he did it and I don't even disagree with his reasoning, right? I'm just saying that like for a lot of Bodhi fans, they look at Burner and Cookies as sort of the evil empire. Yeah, true, true, but... Yeah, I guess I think of it as like, I, I think his intentions are coming for what he hopes is best for the plant. Oh, he's a sweet man. He absolutely, he's not, he's not thinking of it in some kind of like selfish or negative light. I just mean that like, you know, uh, it's a good example of stepping out of your lane and he had a certain lane with people and he, you know, he stepped out of it and it was probably stepping out with Bodhi, but with with burner but you know those guys they desperately need people that are different breeders than um than they've been currently working with they have cookie themselves has stayed way way too much in their own little stream and it's way too inbred in there and so they definitely need to bring people in that can widen that pool because that you've kind of gone anywhere you could have possibly gone in that tiny little shallow in that shallow end yeah, yeah, I definitely can see where you're coming from, and I think this is another one where we could we could probably spend a whole hour talking about this. So we'll we'll definitely touch back on this one in part two. But we could. My phone is going to die too. So I, like uh, this four hours or whatever <laughs> is like now I'm at like eight percent. So we're probably going to have to cut it off regardless because uh, it's going to die, and I'm not going to be able to chat. Yeah, no worries. All right, we'll we'll shorten the final five to the the quick three then quickly. So I'd love to know what's the most memorable experience with cannabis you've ever had. The most memorable experience with cannabis I've ever had, um, when I first realized how powerful haze was, uh, I kept going out to Amsterdam and I kind of thought their weed was bunk compared to ours to some degree, and then I met. Uh, one of Neville's friends who grew for him and then they sold the weed to the coffee shops. He's still around. His name's Steve. And um, I smoked some Neville's haze, just a little pinner. Uh, and uh, by pinner, for people that don't know, it's just a skinny joint. Between me and my buddy who I went out there with and Steve, we smoked that joint and I felt soaring high, psychedelic high, like I was tripping high. To the point where when I walked out of his flat as a, you know, I was probably 24 then or 26 then or something, I like held onto the railing so I could walk down the steps. 
And that was the first time that I realized that maybe some of those old timers talking about how like some of those sativas had this like soaring, psychedelic, disassociative, speedy high, which I kind of thought they were lying about. I realized it could be true. And I, I think that that Neville's haze cut that still exists is very, very different than most weed that's out there. And I would put it up as one of my, probably my most memorable weed experience. Wow. You got me jealous. I'm going to have to go hunt for it. But on to the next question, which is I'm going to drop you off on a desert island and you can take three strains with you. They could be packs of seeds if you want to do some breeding or they could just be clones. And, you know, somehow on this island, you've got the resources to grow them forever. What are you taking with you? Oh, my gosh. Uh, I'm going to take the L.A. I'm going to take the Chem 91. And I'm going to take an NL5 Haze. That's a nice balance. I can get behind that. That's that's good. You're not spreading yourself too thin in one area. I, li- I dig that. So final question we love to ask everyone, at least on their first appearance. I've got a time machine for you. You can go back anywhere, anytime, any place, presumably to collect some cannabis, either cuttings or seeds. Where are you going to go back to? What are you going to get? Oh, absolutely. I would go probably to 1989. And I would buy everything from Super Sativa Seed Club and Neville Seed Bank. That is a brilliant answer. <laughs> absolutely. what That's absolutely what I would do. And, and in line with the earlier answer, I guess we'll, we'll try to grab like 50 of each seed. Yeah, it would, it would, be, it would be a lot. Do you know that, that in like 89, 90, that Neville literally sold 50 packs of Maple Leaf Indica, the same exact... Um, seed batch that he found all of the phenos that he used to make super skunk and all that other stuff with. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He called, you can look it up. It's in his book. It's called Original Afghan Mix. And it was just extra seed that he had that, uh, that uh, Jim Ortega had given him. So I would absolutely go back to 89 or 90 and I would buy both of those companies a, a lot of their stuff. And I would have real NL1, real NL2, real NL5 haze, um, just all that, and just grow it out and see it for myself. That is beautiful. I love that. That's uh, one I'm definitely going to have to consider for my own pick should I ever find said time machine. So I think that just about brings us to the end of it. Are there any general comments or shout-outs you wanted to make? Uh, the only the only general comments or shout-outs that I would make is that um, – you know, to pe- if if anyone out there is thinking about breeding, um, you know, or or saving clones, or you know, don't do it based on anything more than like pick things that you love, right? That you that personally vibe well with you. Try to save a couple. You don't have to save everything. Try to save a couple of things if you can find some old and unpopular stuff that maybe you care about a bunch. Everybody can pitch in a little bit and and this person can hold two or three here and this person can hold five and this person can hold one. But every little bit that you hold of that 80s or 90s or early 2000s era is a gem. And then if you're going to get into breeding, um, try to, like I said, try to find two plants or two lines that you have an idea that you could get both traits into the same line and breed for what you like. Because there's not enough of breeding for what you like. There's breeding for what other people might like. So, you know, breed for what you like. And then if nobody else likes it, at least you do. Brilliant answers. Definitely some sentiments I can echo myself, you know, coming from that passion side of things. It'll be much more likely for you to be successful than if you're just, you know, trying to slap two things together that you think will sell. So once again, a huge shout out to the weed historian, weed librarian, originator of the Mendo Perps, one half of the Breeders Syndicate, so much more. I don't want to sell him short. Huge thank you for coming on the show, Not So Dog. Yeah, man, I, I appreciate your time as well, and uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. So there you have it, friends. What do you think? The end of the second installment for our mammoth episode with Not So Dog. Huge shout out to the man himself. We are incredibly grateful to have you by. I think we might have to get him back very soon for a follow-up. We had such a good time chatting with him, it just makes sense. 
As usual, we want to give a massive shout out to all those who support the show. Huge shout out to the Patreon gang. We love you so much. They've heard this one a few weeks before you have at least. If you want to get early access to episodes, check out the Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash the podcast. Likewise, a huge shout out to our amazing sponsors. If you want to help support the show, please go check out our sponsors. It helps them. It helps us. Massive, massive shout out to the crew at Organics Alive. We love their dry, powdered organic fertilizers, making growing in soil easy from veg to transition to bloom. Any sort of deficiency, any funny situation you find yourself in, they've got organic nutrients that will help you get out of it and help your plant power ahead to be the best you've ever had to date. If you would like to step into the world of organics, but take out all the guesswork, check out Organics Alive. Seeds here now. Best seed bank in the industry. Guarantee on satisfaction, not just germination. Why would you go anywhere else? Pulse sensors. Best sensors in the game. They've just launched their new unit, the Pulse Hub. An all-in-one integrated unit for you to keep your garden's parameters in check and pumping on all cylinders. Thank you so much, Pulse sensors. And last but not least, Copa Biological Systems. All the best pest and predator technology. If you want to keep your garden happy, healthy, pest and pathogen free, check them out guys. Afiparam, Spidex Vitals, two staples in any garden that's looking to be optimized and putting out the highest quality crop to date. Huge thank you again, Copa Biological Systems. So that just about does it for this episode, my friends. We'll see you for the next one. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you.